Addison and Autumn from California. And we've got folks from Maryland, Tacoma, Washington, so all over the place. So we're really excited to have everyone here uh, and everyone um, getting to meet each other virtually. So it's a fun time. So what are we doing today? Um, I'll get past that information. You're all familiar with it. First of all, uh, we're always doing Migratory Bird Day. And as you know, we're celebrating World Migratory Bird Day. We had a big event this weekend, if you were able to join it. Uh, but we do continue throughout the year because birds migrate throughout the year. So we're always excited to do new programs and new activities. Storytime has been a fun one, and we're looking forward to continuing that opportunity. You can see our World Migratory Bird Day poster. And what we've done, if you haven't noticed, is we've been working our way through some of the species on this poster. So for example, we talked about barn owls. And if you look at the poster, do you remember which one is the barn owl? Take a look at the poster and see if you can remember which one is the barn owl on this poster. And if you remember, it's the one that's mostly white with brownish color on the backs of its wings. I don't think I can point to it. I don't know if you can see my pointer on it. Um, but the one with the kind of funny roundish face is the barn owl. So that's the barn owl. And today we're going to talk about the Wilson's warbler. Now the Wilson's warbler isn't on this. Um, and the only reason why is that we couldn't actually find a book about um, the warbler that is on here which is Hi, Rosa. the Hi, Rosa. are you able to get on go to webinar? Uh, Barbara, I can hear you. Can you um, hang on just a second? Can you put it in the chat box? To share your so sorry about that. We have two programs running. Um, so if you can find what you think is a warbler, put it in the chat box. Rosa, which one is to get on to share your screen? Or is it not going or is it on? Not going on? Hang on a second. Let me get my partner here off the off the off the uh off the off the off the audio. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the ones that are warblers tend to be yellow. And so you actually have two warblers on this poster. Uh the, and you'll see them kind of to the left and underneath the dark bluish bird. So those are two warblers that we focused on um, on the poster. All right, so today we are going to learn about tropical forests. We're gonna read the book, Is This Panama? And then we are going to meet Guido. And Guido is from Panama, and he's going to be joining us today to take us on a walk through a Panamanian rainforest. So you're going to get to see what it looks like to be like right outside the door where Guido lives. So that's going to be really fun. Um, I'm going to turn off my camera now and um, then I'm going to focus on the book. So thanks for joining us today. I'm going to do a little bit, a little activity first about rainforest. So hang on there. All right, so what is so special about a rainforest? One is that there are so many different animals in a rainforest. Um, and so when, they, when people study rainforests, they divide the rainforest up into layers. And these are some of the layers. So the very bottom layer is what we call the forest floor. The next layer is what we call the understory. And the next layer is what we call the canopy. And then at the very highest coming out and emerging from the top is what's known as the emergent layer. So what I'd like you to do now is we have a bunch of animals I'm gonna pull up. And I want you to tell me where in the rainforest do you think these animals would live? So for example, Where do you think a snake would live in the rainforest? In the emergent layer, the canopy, the understory, or the forest floor? Where do you think that it would live? Can you put that in the chat box if you have an idea? All right, from the McLornan family, we have the forest floor. All right, so this is a snake. Got another one for the forest floor. 
And you're right, snakes can be found on the forest floor, but remember that snakes can also kind of slither up a tree. So not all snakes stay just on the floor, forest floor. They might actually make it up into the understory or maybe even higher up. I don't know. We're going to ask Guido those questions. All right, next animal. How about this animal? First of all, does anybody know what this is? What a funny looking little animal, very cute and furry. What do you think it is? Okay, we got some good answers. From the Alvarado family, we have that it's a sloth. Akiva says it's a sloth. All right, excellent. You're right, it's a sloth. Which layer of the rainforest do you think a sloth would live in? Which layer would it live in? All right, we've got Levi says the canopy. And yes, probably the canopy, but remember that the sloth is going to be climbing up trees. And so I've got somebody unmuted out there who needs to mute themselves. Um, so sloths can climb up trees. So you might find them at different levels in the canopy or maybe even a little bit higher into maybe the emergent level. We're gonna, again, ask Guido about those things. How about this bird? This is a bird, it does have feathers. Um, where do you think this bird, which is called the harpy eagle, where do you think it would live? Where do you think it would live? All right, we've got emergent layer from Leon. All right, that's what we thought too, but it could also probably be in the, um, it could also be in the canopy as well, I bet, because this is a flying bird. So it depends on maybe where it wants to perch that day. All right, how about the agouti? Where would the agouti live? Where would the agouti live? Does this look like a climbing animal, one that might climb the tree? Does it look like it could fly? No, we have from the Lilines and the Willistons and the Williams, the forest floor. So good, excellent, the forest floor. All right, how about a howler monkey? Where would a howler monkey? All right, howler monkey, any ideas where it would be? Canopy, all right, good job. So we've got the canopy, maybe even to the emergent level, maybe really high, I don't know how high they can climb or they wanna climb, maybe in the understory as well. So they were probably an animal that may use a bunch of, a bunch of different locations. All right, how about a jaguar? Where would a jaguar be? <laughs> Okay, I've got understory, I've got forest floor. And remember, you know, jaguars can actually climb up trees. You know, you see pictures of them like lying on branches. So they might actually be um, on the forest floor as well as maybe in the understory where they might lie on a branch. All right, good job, you guys. All right, so now we are going to go to our book. And again, this is called Is This Panama? A Migration Story by Jan Thorn Thornhill and with the pictures by Soyan Kim. I don't think I pronounced that right, but here we go. When Sammy, the young Wilson's warbler woke up, his toes were colder than they'd ever been before. Even though it was still August, frost, oops, where'd my picture go? Frost twinkled and sparkled on every leaf of his home near the Arctic Circle. Sammy shivered, partly because he was cold and partly because he was excited. If it was this cold, it must be time for him to make his first migration to Panama. Sammy had heard about Panama from older Wilson's warblers. They said that Panama was warm all year long, even at night. Sammy had also heard that some insects in Panama were as big as warblers. He wasn't sure if he believed that though. But where were all the other warblers? Usually there was somebody foraging for food nearby. Sammy hopped up to the top of the tallest dwarf birch, expecting to see someone he knew, but there was no one. Sammy was worried. 
he didn't know how to get to Panama by himself. Sammy spotted a ptarmigan. All summer, the ptarmigans had been hard to see because their brown feathers blended in so well with the landscape. Lately, though, their brown feathers were being replaced by white ones. Have you seen any warblers? Sammy trilled. Nope, clucked the ptarmigan. I bet they've flown south. Warblers always fly south. Is that what you do? Asked Sammy. Don't have to, said the ptarmigan. There's lots of food for me here, and I grow special feathers for winter. Soon I'll be almost completely white. Everybody will be able to see you, said Sammy. Won't that be dangerous? Silly Sammy, chuckled the ptarmigan. I'll be almost invisible once the snow comes. But you, Sammy, you'd better start flying south. Sammy flew higher and longer than he'd ever flown before. He flew for a whole hour and he was getting tired. A caribou was grazing below. Sammy dipped down close. Is this Panama, he asked. I'm supposed to migrate south to Panama. I'm going south, the caribou snorted loudly because caribou always snort loudly, but I've never heard of Panama. I'm heading to my winter forest. Why don't you just stay here? It's very windy out in the open. The snow gets hard and crusty. In the forest, the snow is softer, so it's easier for me to use my hooves to scoop it off, scoop off the lichens I like to eat. I don't like lichens, said Sammy. I like insects. Then you had better keep going. I haven't seen any insects at all today. Sammy had been flying for several hours when he heard a strange trumpeting noise. A flock of sandhill cranes was passing high above him. The birds were fast, and Sammy had to flap his wings like crazy to catch up. Are you going to Panama? He asked breathless, breathlessly. Never heard of it, drawled one of the cranes. We're migrating south to Texas. Another crane noticed that Sammy was tired. Hop on, he said. Thanks, said Sammy, landing on the big bird's hunched back know how to get to Texas. We look for landmarks, special places we recognize along the way. See down there? We look for that pond every year. For the next few days, Sammy hinged rides with the cranes and spent the nights with them in marshes where the gangly birds used their long beaks to probe the mud for roots and worms. But Sammy couldn't see well enough in the dark to find insects to eat. So he said goodbye and continued on his own. Near a huge lake, Sammy was suddenly surrounded by hundreds of green darner dragonflies all flying eastward. Are you migrating? Sammy asked. I sure are. The darner answered. She didn't seem to be looking at Sammy, though it was hard to tell because of her strange insect eyes. Where are you migrating to? asked Sammy. Far enough south that you won't freeze. Then why are you flying east? We're following the shoreline. It can be dangerously windy over the open water. Sammy could fly faster than the dragonflies, so off he went ahead of them. Sammy followed the lake shoreline for two days. At sunset, on the third day, he swooped down into a great forest. Flittering and chipping among the highest branches was a flock of Sammy's warbler cousins. Sammy was thrilled. He was sure he'd made it to Panama. Is this Panama? He asked. Don't I wish, twittered a red star, but no, we're nowhere near Panama. Sammy was disappointed, but then he brightened. Can you show me the way? Sure, we're about to take off. But it's almost dark, cried Sammy. Warblers do migrate at night, you know, said a black Bernian warbler. We follow the stars. The stars, said Sammy, astonished. Of course, we look for partners that match the star maps we have in our heads. When it feels just right, we fly. Sammy stared up at the darkening sky. One group of twinkling stars made him feel all quivery inside. I think I feel it, he sang. And off he flew with the other warblers. A couple of nights later, Sammy was surprised to see stars glittering below him. 
those aren't real stars, a black-throated green warned. Just try to ignore them. But a few minutes later, they were absolutely everywhere. Sammy didn't know which way to fly. He was so confused, he became separated from the flock. Sammy was becoming frantic when he saw another Wilson's warbler. Maybe it was someone who could help him. They were almost close enough to touch beaks when, bonk! Sammy smacked into something hard and flat and invisible. Stunned, he twirled down to the ground. Sammy was lucky. He wasn't badly in injured. He wasn't badly hurt when he hit the window and was able to fly away from the buildings to a meadow. Exhausted, he fell asleep. Sammy woke up surrounded by hundreds of fluttering orange and black wings. Is this a butterfly party? He asked. Oh no, one of the monarchs answered. We just stopped to rest on our way south to Mexico. Is Mexico close to Panama? Sammy asked. Pretty close, the but said the butterfly, but I think Panama's farther. And as the morning sun took away the night chill, the air began to move. This was what the monarchs were waiting for. One by one, they took flight, swirling higher and higher on a warm updraft. Sammy followed. As the day wore on, Sammy and the butterflies found themselves surrounded by ominous towering clouds. The wind turned wild, scattering everyone in all directions. Pummeled by rain, Sammy landed alone on a beach where he waited for the storm to end. Sammy Island hopped through the Bahamas before landing in Cuba, where he joined up with a mixed flock of migrating birds. After a few days, the group crossed over the water to Mexico. They followed the coastline southward, stopping to forage near Mayan ruins and fields of maize and in monkey field rainforests. Eventually, they stopped to look for food near a river. Sammy had been migrating for almost three weeks. He was so tired. He didn't even notice a juicy caterpillar walking right over his foot. He was so tired. He didn't care if he ever got to Panama. He let out a big sigh. Well, a big sigh as a tiny bird like Sammy can make. That's when he noticed something peculiar about the thicket. Sammy suddenly felt all quivery inside and then he understood. He wouldn't have to ask anywhere where he was anymore because he knew where he was. Sammy was in Panama. He'd made it to his winter home. And this is the long trip that Sammy made all the way, he can make it all the way from Alaska. Some of them live in Alaska. This is mostly a Western bird, all the way down to where that star is at the bottom. All right. Thanks for joining in on the story with about Panama. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna invite Guido to join us and let me find Guido because I don't know where he is. He is not, there he is. Guido, I'm gonna let you in and have you show your camera and take us on a walk in Panama and show everyone the rainforest. They've now learned about it. And Guido, you should be on and able to share your microphone and hopefully your camera. Hello. There's your... Hey, Guido, where's Hello. your camera? I have no idea. <laughs> Can you turn it on for me? No, I don't see it showing up by your name. I can hear you. I can hear you too. While we're waiting for That's Guido great. to figure out his camera, does anybody have any questions for him? about Panama, about bird migration. Hello, hello. Yeah, can you hear us, Guido? I can hear you, I can see your screen. I cannot see your face. I am not sure where I can. So my camera I've turned off for right now, but I can turn it back on. I'm here. Yay. I can see yours. 
Can you turn on my camera from your end? So I don't see your camera. I don't see a camera am I, to turn am I a, present, am I a presenter already? You should make me a presenter. I don't think you need to be, but I will do that. Please do, because I don't see any option in my screen for. Okay, Yay. try that. I can see now I am presenter. You still don't have a camera. I'm going to take questions right now, though, because I know people yeah, have do. questions while you're waiting. So if you have a question um, about the rainforest, um, do, are there, um, Levi, your question is, do they have other birds like them? Um, do you mean like the Wilson's warbler? Yes, the answer is yes. Amazingly enough, these um, migratory warblers that arrive in Panama um, oftentimes join in with the mixed species foraging flocks in the rainforest. So not always would they be, I mean, oftentimes they will, rather than being by themselves, they will join in the feeding parties from the local species. So they, uh, they will join some of the resident warblers like the flame throated warbler, like the uh, um, the slate throated red start, the colored red start, which are some of the resident warblers, uh, their flocks will be joined in uh, with some of the migratory warblers, like the black burning warbler, Canada warbler, and Wilson's warblers included, indeed. Thanks, Guido. Here's a really hard one for you. What's the longest flight for a bird in the Americas or elsewhere? Wow, that's a question for you, actually, <laughs> because uh, there are seabirds, I presume, albatross and, and uh, some wim willets and wimbrels undertake very, very long um, single flights, right? Oh, absolutely. Some of them, well, um, some of the shorebirds, for example, make long flights. They stop usually. There's some that don't stop. Um, I think the for example, it depends on where they start from and where they end from. So let's take the peregrine falcon, uh, which can migrate all the way from Alaska to Argentina. But, you know, peregrine falcons are found in a lot of different cities. So they might be coming different distances, depending on where they start from and where they end, but thousands of miles. Um, one of the Godwits makes a 7,000 mile nonstop trip. But of course, it's going to New Zealand from Alaska. We have another question. And um, Guido, you might want to try to just get on your computer. Um, that might work. Um, do they have other friends or family like them, or do they have baby birds? So do you mean, Levi, when they get to Panama, do they have other birds like them there? Is that your question? I guess it means whether some of the ones stay here over winter, uh, over winter and over the because some species of migratory birds, like some sandpipers, uh, would stay here throughout the first year. So they, they would arrive here and they would not be coming back that first year. So like I understand some of the Western sandpipers perhaps do that, uh, that they would not have a rush to go back to the States at the end of the fall or at the end of a, the summer in the fall migration. And some would stay here um, spending that first year here in Panama. I don't, I'm not sure that is the case with the warblers, uh, but it's the case with some of the shorebirds, indeed. All right, thanks, Guido. Um, again, if you can get on a computer, you might have more luck with the camera if you have a computer with a camera. Um, we have another question. Well, Levi's got a lot of questions. Um, um, the question is, could they survive if they didn't migrate? I think that's your question, Levi, is if they did not migrate, could they survive? Yeah, the, the oops, Guido, I can't hear you. Um, the question that the answer is, Levi, is that they probably could not survive. The, the reason why a bird migrates isn't because it gets cold. So birds don't really get cold. They have feathers. And you know, you probably see birds all year round at your house. So some of them can live through the winter wherever you live. I know I live in the, in the Colorado where there's a lot of snow and we have birds who live here all year. Um, but what happens is some birds don't have food during the winter. So for example, remember, what did the Wilson's family, the Wilson's warbler eat? 
it was Eve looking for insects, right? So when it gets cold, what happens to the insects? The insects die. For birds who eat insects and who can't find insects because it's too cold for it, for the insects, they gotta go somewhere else to eat. So they go down to some of them, at least like Sammy the warbler, go down to places like the tropics where they find lots of insects. So there's a lot of birds lot there of during that Bye, time. Everybody. But um, they are finding a lot of food as well. So there's a lot of food then. Good question. So some birds can't survive if they don't migrate. Others do just fine, especially the ones that eat seeds. All right. So did everyone bring a piece of paper with them today? Did everyone bring a piece of paper with them today? One of the activities that we had for you today was to do an origami bird. And so do you have a square piece of paper? If you have a square piece of paper, I'm gonna to bring to you Chu Yu, who's also on our staff, and she is going to help you make a bird. All right, so step one is to take your piece of paper and fold it to make a triangle. All right, step number two is to bring the right pointy corner over to meet the top corner of the triangle. Okay, let us know in the chat box if you have any trouble with this, okay? All right. So again, you have a try, you cut, you, you divided your paper in half, and then you fold it over a little piece of it. And now, oh, now we're going to do the other corner. And so now you should have a square, and it's got two flaps. Tell us if you're having any trouble with that. Okay. All right. And now you're going to make sure you have the open and flats at the top. And then you're going to fold up the bottom. This is just going to make it so that your bird can stand up. And then you're gonna fold in the sides, and this is gonna be the bird's wings. And then it looks like we're gonna be able to get Guido on camera. So when we're done making the bird, we show him. All right, <laughs> now we're going to fold back the head of the bird a little bit. And you can draw on the eyes and the nose and cut out and glue on the feet so that you have a bird. Did everybody get that? If you're on the computer and you want us to do it again, we'll do it again in just a few minutes. But right now, it looks like we could get Guido on the screen. Do you? All right, Dito, I still can't see you. I see that your camera is on. Yes. Can you hear me? I, I hear you. I don't see you, but I see that your camera is on. Yeah. Um, I'm reconnecting, see if it works again. Okay. Sorry, guys. Sometimes when we work with um partners who aren't close to us or in our office we have a little bit of technical difficulty all right we will do the Bye. bird again we'll see if we can get um guido on the video so he can show you his backyard which is in panama and then we'll show you how to do the bird one more time with to you Guido, we're going to do the bird one more time where we try while we try to get you on camera okay okay all right, thanks. All right, here we go again. So take your square piece of paper and fold it in half diagonally. 
right? And then bring up one corner to the other corner. All right, so for this, uh, this is the Lee family and another Williams family. Then do the same on the other side. Bring it up. All right, now you have a square again. And what you should have is that one end is, one corner is closed, but the other is kind of open at the top. You can see how it's flapping around. So you want to leave the open flaps at the top and at the bottom, where it's all closed up, fold it up a little bit. That's your bird stand. All right. And then we're going to fold in the sides. Those are going to make the bird's wings. One side, and then the other side. Origami is so much harder than it looks. All right. The next step is to flip the paper over. Okay, now you're just looking at the side with nothing folded. And fold down the top two flaps to make the bird's beak. There we go. And then you're going to fold back the top flap that's open, and that's going to make the head of the bird. And then you can put your eyes on the front. I think she even has a marker here, and you can cut out and glue on the feet. You can decorate it however you want. She's made some great ones here for you to see what they look like. Can you hear me, Susan? Thanks to you. Everybody get their bird made. If you want to show us your bird, I'd be happy to put you on the camera and show you show your bird. So just um, in the attendee list, um, just do that. So ah, Guido, you're starting to come on. I think you're about to happen here. Thanks again, everyone, for your patience. Um, again, he is in Panama, so it's even amazing that we can do this. But Guido, I see you, but I don't have a picture. You're almost yes. there. No, I can't see you, but I can see your name, and I can see that your camera is trying to come up. If okay. anybody would like to share their bird with us, I'd be happy to put you on the camera with the bird that you made, or put you on the camera to ask a question of Guido. Yeah, I can be happy. So just let us know in the question box. All right, Hector would like to share. Okay, so that's Esther. So Esther, hang on just a second and I'll put you on camera. All right, I'm sending you the camera option, Esther. And we'll look forward to seeing you up there. Uh, All right, we can hear you, Esther. Um, you need to put Hi. Hey, there. Good morning. Oh, good job. It worked. We're always so excited when origami works. <laughs> Very good job, Hector. Thanks for sharing that with us. Thanks. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for coming. We hope you come again next week, Hector. Yep. We will. Okay, Guido, someone is asking you what the temperature is in Panama. Is it warm there? If, if it's warm right now? Yes. Oh, yes. You can say that again. <laughs> Temperature right now is probably like uh, 90 degrees, and the humidity is like 90 degrees, too. I'm not sure. Can you hear the monkeys in the background? Ooh. You can hear howler monkeys in the background. <coughs> oh, I heard that. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, can we get them again? Um. Well, they have to, they'll call territorially every now and then. They okay. go something like, <clears throat> something like that. Wow, that was amazing. All so right. I'm, I'm trying to log off again and back on in case I'm not sure something's going on here that doesn't allow me to. Okay, to... yeah, there's something about your camera that's not showing. Maybe your permissions are turned off on your computer. Um, any other questions for Guido, or does anyone need us to make a bird one more time so that you get it, or did you miss that?
All right, everyone. I want to thank you for your patience with our with our technology issue this week. And hopefully we'll be able to get Guido back on. He's going to join Spanish story time at um, that would be noon mountain time, one central, two eastern. You're welcome to join us for Spanish time. And hopefully we'll have figured out Guido's um, technology challenge. And he'll be on to show you the, um, the rainforest in Panama. So if you want to come back on, uh, the program will be in Spanish, um, but you can listen to it again if you like. Um, and thank you again so much for your patience today, and thanks for joining us. Next week, our story is about a turn, searching for sky, and we hope that you can join us. Um, oh, yeah, Levi, we can put you on camera if you want to hang on just a second. I didn't see you asking there, but hang on just a second, and we'll put you on. Um, unless you already left. Nope, there you are. I'm going to make you a panelist. Here you go, Levi. All right, Levi, you should be on there. I see you. You should be able to unmute yourself. There you go. I can see your microphone. And next, your camera. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Levi. There you are. Hi, Levi. Good to see you. Oh. Can I please show you my bird that I made? I would love. We would love to see your bird. Oh my gosh, you made two. Those are excellent. <laughs> Good job. So were you were able to follow us the first time or did it take the second time? Um, the first time. Good for you. Okay. It took us about three times just to learn how to make this to show it to you guys. Thank it was pretty you. hard. Thank you, Levi. Thanks for coming today. Um, the monkeys, are they in Guido's backyard is a question. And yes, the monkeys are in Guido's backyard. Guido's home is right in the rainforest. And so he has a ton of, um, he has a ton of, uh, of um, uh, wildlife in his backyard, goodies and amazing birds and, and all sorts of animals. So um, he's, he's got wildlife in his well in his backyard that we would just love we love to see i've actually gotten to go visit guido before um it's an amazing place and he does run school programs and guest programs for anybody who's interested in that guido's actually a guide as well uh, so he leads birding trips educational programs for youth of all ages high school elementary um, programs and runs a hostel where people can actually stay so Guido, I've got you up. I can see your, your microphone again, but um, I'm not seeing you. I see your camera's I'm, on. But I'm again, here. I'm not, I know you're there. <laughs> we just can't see you. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Something's not right about the camera, but I guess we'll, yeah. we can answer we'll the try question. Again after this. Yeah, we'll try it again after this. Um, Levi, did you share your birds already? You did, didn't you, or not? Hey, um, Guido, they were asking about what kind of birds you have right by your, what kind of animals you have right by your house. Can you tell oh, them a little bit? Wow. Yeah, we're very fortunate. We're located right next to the rainforest. Uh, you may have heard of the Panama Canal, I'm sure. Uh, the Panama Canal is, is this shortcut in the, connecting the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean. And um, to go through the canal, uh, the ships have to go through locks, so through locks, uh, which are like gigantic, uh, bathtubs that allow uh, ships to be raised and lowered to different levels, okay? Uh, but what's interesting from our perspe perspective as biologists is that uh, these bathtubs that, or the locks are filled and lowered using uh, rain water, water from the rainforest. So it's been very uh, important for the authorities to use, uh, to protect the, the rainforest that provides the rainfall that fills the reservoirs of water that are required for the canal operation. So that means that we're very lucky to have a lot of rainforest nearby Panama City. As a matter of, have, as a matter of fact, we have about seven protected areas within an hour of Panama City. And that's where I live right now at this, in this quarantine. I am very lucky because I'm quarantined right next to the rainforest. And um, occasionally you can hear the howler monkeys calling in the background. Occasionally we get 
tamarind monkeys that come by to grab a banana. Thank you, Susan, for the bananas. And birds, of course, come along, and we have parakeets, parrots, and trogons, and mutmuts that swing by. We have a lot of hummingbirds that drink the nectar or the sugar water that we put up for them in addition to the plants that have flowers in the background. So we feel very fortunate to have this, um, this um, wildlife all around. Yeah, you are lucky. So we did we did send um, Guido some uh, bananas to feed the wildlife, hoping that we could have his camera on. But again, if you guys want to join Spanish story time and we're going to work with Guido to see what we can make happen here in terms of his camera, then I invite you to join in just about 35 minutes again for the next story time in Spanish. Uh, but you hopefully will get this figured out. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. Again, next week is a story about a, an Arctic tern, uh, one of the longest distance migrants in the world. And we'll be excited to share that. And as always, we'll have some fun guest and activity for you. So please sign up at migratorybirdday.org forward slash story time. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye.